Our scripture reading should be coming up here as we continue in uh, Romans uh, chapter 9. <clears throat> now I'm going to add a couple verses and, uh, so you won't have it on the screen. Um, you can turn to Romans 9 in the Pew Bible, which is also the ESV, and uh, you'll be able to follow along. I'm going to go up to verse 18, and uh, next week we're going to finish the chapter, I think, although uh, there's a lot of questions that are difficult. <clears throat> Today we're focusing on God's sovereignty, and in particular in salvation, and uh, you'll see where that goes, but we'll have to also talk about God's plan and sovereignty and salvation next week as well. Um, when we talk about is God fair, is God unjust, but we'll start with God's sovereignty this morning. So bear with me. Let's begin with verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham, because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. If you underline your Bible, if you have your own Bible, that's a good thing to underline. It's the children of the promise that are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on who I will have mercy, and I will have compassion, on whom I will have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Amen. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show you my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. The word of the Lord. You'll have to bear with my sniffles this morning. I apologize for those watching. They're going to hear me blow my nose, I guess. I should have really done it with gusto, but we won't, we won't do that. Before we uh, look at God's word, I just want to make, take a moment in prayer. Uh, Kathy was uh, supposed to be here today, and she was supposed to have Kids Chapel. Um, her first cousin, uh, she's very close with her, uh, her husband died, and so Kathy's at the service this afternoon uh, down in New York, and uh, we'll be back, Lord willing, tonight, but I wanted to pray for the family, and uh, also I know a church was struck by lightning uh, this weekend and burned down yesterday, so we want to pray for them. Our Father, we thank you that you are sovereign. We pray for wisdom and understanding as we look at a difficult chapter in Scripture, uh, help us, Lord, to trust you. Often, Father, we, we put ourselves in your place to try to understand and figure some of these things out. Uh, help us to rely on your Holy Spirit to teach us today. I pray for Kathy and for her cousin Mary Lou and the family as they are, are mourning uh, Dill's loss today and uh, the service this afternoon. We pray there would be opportunities, Lord, um, for your word. And uh, we pray for safe uh, return uh, trip for Kathy this evening. We also pray, I believe, the church in Spencer that was struck by lightning. And uh, can't imagine what they're going through today, but we pray for that congregation. Um, just watch over that congregation, Lord. Give them the ability to rebuild if that's your will. And we just ask all these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. 
also want to welcome any visitors today. We're good to see you. Some I haven't seen in a while. It's good to see you as well. So God's sovereignty and um, <clears throat> a difficult subject, but hopefully we can make some headway this morning. In his commentary of Romans, Dr. Uh, Ernest Campbell says the following, or it reads this way, Paul's purpose here is to verify his anguish for his kinsmen, the Israelites, whom God had made custodians of his word and the progenitors of Christ's body. He explains that God's word has not failed because many Israelites lack faith. For only those who are children of the promise are children of God, those called according to his elective purpose. He affirms that God does not act unrighteously, but bestows his mercy selectively, and he quotes Isaiah uh, again to remind us that only a remnant of Israel will be saved. Now chapters 9, 10, and 11 of Romans is quite a departure from the first eight chapters, which deal so much in God's great salvation and in our fallen and broken creation that longs to be redeemed and bought back, uh, looking for the return of God in Christ. And now in 9, 10, and 11, he's focusing on Israel and the fact that God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. As author uh, Warren Wearsby writes, it seems strange that Paul would interrupt his discussion of salvation in chapters 1 through 8 and now devote his time in three chapters to the nation of Israel. But he says this is not an interruption at all. It is necessary as part of Paul's argument for justification by faith. Meaning again that even though Israel were the children of Abraham and you would think they have a birthright to salvation, the fact is they have to become a child of the promise. They need to be justified by faith just like you and me. None of us earn our salvation. We're not born with salvation. And he's going to use Israel as an example of this in chapters 9, 10, and 11 to again drive home the point that you and I are saved by faith. Sola fide, faith alone, sola Christa, uh, Christ alone, right, and, uh, and so on. So if you're familiar with those five solas that uh, many teach. So this morning we're going to look at God's sovereignty in choosing Israel and also in his plan of salvation. Because remember, uh, Israel's prominent in the plan of salvation because Jesus was Jewish, wasn't he? <laughs> Jesus, it says in our text, the line of Christ is through Israel, and so through David, and so on. So um, in God's sovereignty and salvation, he chose Israel and, of course, brought Christ through Israel. Uh, three points this morning. We're going to talk about God choosing Israel, verses 1 through 5. Uh, children of Abraham and children of God, verses 6 through 13. But again, just because you're born uh, a Jew doesn't mean you're a believer. You have to be a child of the promise. And then thirdly, and we'll just do an overview of God's sovereignty in salvation, which will kind of be preparation for next week uh, when we talk about uh, God's justice, that God is fair, even though sometimes we wonder as human beings. So in God's sovereignty, our text says that he chose Israel. Again, Paul in verse 1, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. And again, he's wishing and longing, verse 3, for his brothers and kinsmen, according to the flesh, Israelites, verse 4. Uh, to him, again, was the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises, the patriarchs, and from them, according to the flesh, comes Jesus Christ, who is the bearer of the new covenant, and, of course, the one who brings us salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. And we'll be celebrating that as a reminder a little later on. Dr. Campbell notes that God had placed Israel in a sonship or a familial relationship with him. That Israel belongs, to Israel belongs the glory which belonged to them in the past and will fully be expressed again in the Messianic kingdom. And the covenants belong to Israel, which confirms a future relationship with God. And the law from God was placed and enacted through angels by the hand of Moses, given to Israel and not Gentiles. And all the promises to Abraham also belong to Israel. By the way, if you're familiar with Genesis 12 and 17, um, the promise to Abraham 
uh, of uh, descendants, uh, you know, outnumber the stars and so on, uh, wasn't just a physical like birth of people. It's talking about salvation, that salvation would come down through Abraham, down through Israel as Jesus Christ, right, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, John 1, 14. And that uh, this is a spiritual promise, and yet many of the unconditional promises given to Abraham in Genesis 12 and other passages in Genesis have not yet been fulfilled. And so in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Paul is going to argue that God still has a remnant, God still has a, 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 a plan for Israel, and that many will still come, and one day they will look on the one whom they have pierced, and they will receive Christ as their Messiah, Zechariah tells us this. But until then, Paul says, I'm in anguish. I'm in sorrow. He's saying, my desire is for my people not to be saved later. (laughs) I want them saved now. Now, we might have trouble understanding Paul's anguish, but maybe we shouldn't. Do we not all have family and friends who have not yet come to Christ? Don't we? Do you cry out to God for their salvation? Do you, uh, maybe when you remember, you anguish for them? You have family, friends, uh, others, co-workers. Perhaps when you bring up salvation through Christ, they mock you or they they tease you a little bit. But we have burdens for people, don't we? We should. Perhaps we don't have as great a burden for them as we should. That's why we had Engage 360 here to kind of remind us that um, we might be the only gospel people ever get as we share our lives with them, whether they're family or not, you might be the only Christ they ever see. And then I look at my life, I go, oh boy, I'm it. But that might be the case, right? Especially with family. And so Paul's crying out, he's saying to God, I'm longing, I have anguish and sorrow for my people. And we should all have some sorrow and anguish for our people too. Our country, we see increases in immorality. We see all kinds of strange things happening. We could get into inflation and and all that kind of stuff, but I'm more interested in in what's happening as far as morality goes. As we continue to spiral downward away from God and towards chaos, right? Paul saw that in Israel, Remember, Paul, uh, he didn't uh, follow Christ right away either, did he? In fact, he persecuted the church until Acts 9 when the Damascus Road experience happened and then he became a follower and now this anguish for his his kinsmen. He wants others in Israel to find Christ as he did. And so there's that, that desire. Now, according to the Bible, and we won't belabor verses 1 through 5, it is clear that uh, God had a plan to choose Israel. Uh, In the Bible, uh, God tells the people of Israel through the prophets, look, don't think you're special, okay? Why I chose Abraham and chose you, I didn't have to. I could have chosen anybody, couldn't he? If God's sovereign? And he says, so, okay, Abraham, I chose you, and he told Isaac and all the descendants after but I didn't have to. You're nothing special. But yet I did chose you. And out of you comes the Christ. That's a great thing. But God could choose anybody. Balaam, the prophet, found out God can speak through a donkey. Right? And then I'm speaking right now and that's kind of hurting my feelings a little. Because <laughs> God can use a donkey. You got, some of you got that. It took a little while. So when, when we're speaking to people, remember, God can speak through a donkey. That's for all of us. But he chose Israel. Abraham is God's chosen people. And uh, Jesus comes through the Jewish line, through King David, because he's going to rule forever one day on the throne of David. But they were adopted by God, chosen by God. The Christ comes in the flesh as an Israelite. And salvation comes through Israel. Jesus said, salvation is of the Jews. He told that to the Samaritan woman, remember? 
when he's talking to her? She said, you Jews say, you know, and we should worship in, in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, yes, salvation is of the Jews. I'm here. I'm going to die for you. Right? Um, and, and so uh, salvation comes from them. God chose them as a special people. But as we're going to see, you and I also become a part of that equation. So verses 1 through 5, God chose Israel. Verses 6 through 13, uh, children of Abraham are not necessary uh, necessarily children of Abraham because they're born as a Jew or born as a direct descendant of Abraham. The children of God are, are children of God because of the promise. And that's what Paul says in this next section. Uh, did the word of God fail because not every person born a Jew or an Israelite came to salvation? Did God fail? He says no. God has a certain group of people that came out of that as a children of promise you're not a a born again Christian if you will you're not saved unless you're saved by the promise which is by faith now he's writing again in in to the Romans but a lot of Jewish people especially Pharisees and other leaders they felt they didn't have to do anything they they were born without sin because they were religious leaders they had the birthright of Abraham in fact, when they threw a guy out of the synagogue once, they said, hey, you were born in sin, buddy, not us. We're children of Abraham. In John 8, they said that again to Jesus. You know, they put, I could see them puffing up their chest, you know. Don't talk to us, Jesus. We're children of Abraham, right? And you know what Jesus said? Remember what he said in chapter 8, 44? Uh-uh. He says, you're children of the devil. You think they like that? The disciples said, Jesus, what are you doing? You're going to get him upset. <laughs> he didn't care, right? He was trying to tell them, look, you're not, you're not children of Abraham. You're not children of the promise because you were physically born. You have to be spiritually born again. He told that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. That which is born of the flesh is just flesh. That which is born of the spirit, now that's spirit. Nicodemus said, I don't understand. Can I enter my mother's womb a second time? Good luck. No, Jesus said, no, you're getting it all wrong. I'm not talking about a physical rebirth. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. And then you'll be a child of the promise. And that's what our text is telling us. Your spiritual pedigree, your physical, excuse me, your physical pedigree does not save you. Now, when Matt uh, Smith was here a couple weeks ago, he talked about talking to a young man, and the young man's grandfather had bought a pew in the church. I guess they had a, a thing, they needed pews, and so his grandfather donated and dedicated a pew to the church. So the young man said, well, I, I guess I'm a Christian because grandpa bought a pew. And so Matt said to us, was, is he a Christian because his grand... No, He's not a Christian because his grandfather bought a pew any more than if I donate a stained glass window to a church. Just like if you go to McDonald's, that doesn't make you a hamburger. Right? It doesn't work that way. Confirmation, a good thing. Baptism, good thing. But it doesn't save you. You have to be a child of promise, which is through faith. So you can understand why he's telling this uh, to these Jewish audience here. And he goes on. He says, this is about the promise. Verse, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 8. They are children of God because they're children of the promise. They're counted as spiritual offspring. Okay. Now, in the book of Galatians, Paul gets into more detail. And then he says, look, you don't even have to be Jewish. You can be a Gentile. And then you are born into and grafted into the children of God. And now you're a descendant of Abraham as well. We're spiritual descendants of Abraham. So I told the first service, Mazel Tov, right? So we, we, are, we are grafted in and are children of Israel through the promise, which is a spiritual promise. And we get there by and through faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross when he shed his blood and then when he rose from the dead. Amen? That's what, that's what saves us. We got to make sure we get that right. J.W. Nichols wrote this 
Israel had all the privileges which were God-given. And this also proves the sovereignty of God, but also showing that God could also admit Gentiles according to his election without annulling the promises given to Israel. So salvation is never determined by flesh. It is determined by the promise of God, by his mercy. Thank God that some will come by faith because of the sovereignty and the mercy of God, which we may never fully understand. Maybe in heaven we'll go, oh, now I get it. Because I wonder sometimes, why me? Why am I born again? Why did Christ uh, open up my heart and mind to understand that I can't do this on my own? That no work that I perform is going to save me. My hope and trust is in the work of Christ and what he did. I hope that's where you are as well. So there's the old covenant, and he refers to that, but then there's the new covenant. The book of Hebrews says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the mediator of a new covenant. That's what we're following today. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The covenant that he mediates is better, Hebrews 8.6. Galatians chapters 3 and 4 say, If you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Welcome to Judaism. There you go. So that we might receive adoption as sons. And so when God said to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis, your offspring will be like the stars of the sky. He wasn't talking about just those born in the flesh. He's talking about spiritual offspring. And Galatians chapter 3 and 4 remind us of this. So God chose Israel, and God has a plan for Israel. And uh, we are uh, in the children of Abraham as children of the promise. So children of Abraham and children of God by the promise of God. And lastly, God's sovereignty in salvation. We're going to do this in like two or three minutes. Again, Nichols wrote that God must be absolute in salvation. Now, this is a problem for some, and next week we're going to talk about, is God fair? Of course, the answer is yes, but sometimes people ask that question. Sometimes what we do by accident, I don't think we do it on purpose, is we make ourselves God because we say, look, you know, everybody should get in to heaven. Um, God should just save everybody. And if he doesn't, he's not fair. We've all had that thought, I'm sure. Uh, the modern teaching is called universalism, and many people teach that. Many churches are saying it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, what you think. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, everyone's going to heaven. Now, I was sharing uh, this with somebody and, um, in a Christian bookstore. It was actually the owner of the bookstore. And she said, yeah, God loves everybody. Everybody gets in. And I said, really, everybody? I said, you really believe that? And she said, yeah, it's Okay. Let's start with Hitler. Does, does Hitler get in? And she's like, well, maybe not him. And I said, well, what about Joseph Stalin? And I just listed. And so we got down through about a dozen or more despots. And she said, yeah. They I said, well, here's the problem. If now you're admitting that some don't get in. Your whole theory that everybody gets in has just been blown, right, logically. And so then you, then you have to get into what is the plan of salvation in the Bible under a sovereign God who is in control of all that. And we have to admit, we don't understand God's mercy and why some receive him as Savior and some don't. But we know from experience as Christians that, and you've witnessed to people, I had a friend in high school, and I witnessed to him all the time, and one day he just said, look, it's not for me. I'm not interested. Well, I don't know where he is today because that was a long time ago. I hope he's come to faith, but I don't know. Some people say they don't want it. Some people decide there is no God. They don't want to believe in a God. They want to believe in something else, you know. I believe in blackstrap molasses, you know. I drink that, I'll be healthy, whatever. Um, some people think we're gods or we'll become a God. But what do you say to them, right? The Bible has a plan that God is sovereign and control of. And the Bible says it does not depend on human will or exertion, as we read in the text, but on God and his mercy. 
not by human will. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not by blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but by the will of God. Simply stated here, if you're a Christian, it was God's will. Do we understand that? I don't. And we'll talk more about this next week. So God chose Israel. There are children of Abraham and children of God, but through the promise, through Christ. There's no other way for salvation except through Christ. And that God is sovereign in his salvation. God is the architect of the universe. God is the architect of the covenants, old and new. God, therefore, is the architect of salvation, which is through Jesus Christ. Do we understand the entire process of our salvation? Are we trusting in Christ or something else? Have you come to true faith in Jesus Christ today? I hope so. The Bible is very clear. Are you trusting God or trusting self? Trusting God or something or, or someone else? The Bible says there's one God, there's one faith, there's one salvation. I hope and trust that you are familiar with it, but that you've believed and are trusting and have received Christ as your Savior. Let's pray a moment. Father, um, a lot going on in Romans 9, and we'll continue next Sunday. I pray folks will go home and study and, and review some of this because it's so needed. We need to understand salvation. It's the most important thing. And like Paul, we have friends and family that are not believers, and our desire, like Paul, is for them to come to faith. We pray for any uh, that don't know Christ, some who will even listen to this sermon or watch it on TV, Lord, that you might speak to them, that you might call them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.